Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Lori Bell, and on behalf of um, my partner, uh, Dr. Bill Fisher, we'd like to welcome you to this um, fall colloquium. Um, on November 2nd and 3rd, um, we're pleased to announce we'll be having a Library 2.0 um, conference, and it's free, and we have a have a great website set up for it. So check that out. We have um, presenters and um, from all over the world that will be presenting at this event. So today we're really pleased to have um, Jeff Frank, who is an alum alumni of uh, San Jose State University um, School of Library and Information Science. He graduated uh, last spring with the Master in Library and Information Science. He's currently um, a software support specialist with the CMS project team at San Jose State. Um, before he came uh, to San Jose State, he completed a certificate program um, at Idaho State in geotechnologies. He's a native of Pennsylvania, and he holds a BA in history and geography uh, from Penn State. And today, um, Jeff is going to talk about his thesis and the research he conducted while working on the thesis. Um, with all the um, major weather uh, patterns we've been having, the tsunami in Japan and Hurricane Irene, his study of the impact of Hurricane Katrina, Katrina is uh, more relevant than ever. So Jeff, welcome. We're really glad to have you, and I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming in today. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you. Um, I see some folks here uh, that I've seen here uh, at, at various points. Uh, this is good. So thanks for coming in. Uh, as uh, Lori mentioned, uh, yes, I'm here to talk a little bit to give some perspective about my uh, thesis today. Um, I have to say it was, it was a long process, but it was very rewarding. And I think that this will be of benefit to people who are just curious to know about the process and the inner workings of, of compiling a thesis uh, versus, say, the ePortfolio, the other culminating experience here uh, to graduate from the SLIS program. Um, also, I think this will be of use to students <clears throat> Excuse me. I think this will be of use to students who are maybe on the fence about whether to do the thesis or the uh, e-portfolio as the culminating experience. Uh, my obviously, I'm here to advocate that the thesis is the way to go. Uh, I think for my for who I am, for my research interests, and how I approached uh, this, this, the research material in my program, this is the best uh, avenue for me. So I guess we could uh, move along here. So let me go to the next slide. Hi. OK. So there we are. So about me, just a couple of minor points. I live here in California. I live in Morgan Hill, which is a little south, about 10 miles south of San Jose, uh, California here. And I do work at uh, SJSU. As Laura said, I work one floor up. So very convenient for me. Um, and I did attend uh, the SLIS program uh, from fall 2007 until spring 2011. And I did graduate this past May with the thesis option. So um, also, before before I go on, I think if anybody has any questions, if we can hold them to the end, that would be wonderful. Uh, just want to kind of keep the flow going here, and, uh, and then anybody has any questions and comments, they can certainly ask them at the end. So, so let's get going here a little more. Okay. So here we go. This is my thesis topic. Uh, I was, it you know, took a little tweaking here with my, uh, with my committee and I. But uh, it basically ended up being the impact of Hurricane Katrina on uh, Gulf Coast libraries and their disaster planning. Uh, my goal here uh, was to examine, as you can see here, the impact that Hurricane Katrina did have on the Gulf Coast library community in the most affected parts of southeastern Louisiana and southern Mississippi. And I was also looking at the role that existing disaster plans played in preserving select libraries' collections before, during, and after the disaster. Okay. So let's go to the next slide here. Oh, there we go. And uh, I just wanted to just give a quote, unquote, shout out, I hate that terminology, uh, to my thesis committee. Uh, or as I said here, I would not be giving this presentation without their guidance. Uh, Dr. Debbie Hansen, uh, she was my thesis committee chair. And my thesis committee members, uh, Dr. Susie Aber 
and uh, Dr. Pat Franks, uh, no relation, uh, but it, it was just a wonderful experience working with uh, Debbie, Susie, and Pat. Um, I, I'll be forever in their debt, and it was just wonderful working with them. I really learned a lot. So if we can just move on to the next slide, that would be great. Okay. So why did I choose this as a thesis topic? Um, I've always been interested in, um, in disasters ever since I was a kid. Uh, I've always just been fascinated by them. Uh, not that I look forward to them, nothing like that, but I've just been fascinated by them, uh, as well as their impact on, on human society and throughout history. I've spent most of my life in northeastern Pennsylvania in the Wilkes-Barre area, Wilkes-Barre Scranton area, and that part of the country tends to see some pretty extreme weather. I've encountered many blizzards, severe thunderstorms, accompanying tornado scares, uh, hurricanes, floods, uh, you name it really. Even even drought. I remember 1988, big drought uh, that summer. It was pretty bad. Uh, and then as a result, I did pick up an appreciation and a respect for this uh, natural phenomenon. Um, and another reason is that I was really appalled at, after watching the coverage of, uh, the media coverage of the recovery of hurricane of the Gulf Coast as a result of Hurricane Katrina, how it overwhelmed the Gulf Coast, uh, and how uh, the the recovery just went just sluggish, and it was really inexcusable. And I think a lot of people, rightly so, were were outraged at that. And I think I wanted to kind of be a voice uh, for them in any way that I, in the small way that I could here, and. Um, Honestly, I just knew that before starting as a SLIS student, as a result of that, since that was the most, really the most talked about disaster in recent years up to, at that point, I knew that that was what I wanted to focus on and its impact on the Gulf Coast libraries because I knew that part of the country is very vulnerable to flooding uh, and natural disaster as hurricanes. So if we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so. I guess it comes down to why did I choose doing this uh, over ePortfolio. Um, it really was not a decision for me at all. Um, I knew that these were the two options that I had to choose from, and I did read through what would be required with ePortfolio and obviously what would be required with the thesis. And I'm, I, I, the ePortfolio just didn't really appeal to me. I kind of take a traditionalist view of graduate work, and I, I just wanted to do a thesis, really, is what it comes down to. I wanted to prove to myself that I could do this uh, that was so really research intensive. Uh, and I can guarantee you my wife can definitely verify that this is all that I would be doing whenever I would be home, either that or stressing about it. Uh, in any event, and I also wanted to contribute uh, an original body of research to the library and information sciences excuse me, field. Um, and finally, really, I just thought it was such a lofty goal, I wanted to throw my hat in the ring and see if I could do it. And very fortunate for me, I did it. And um, I'm still kind of pinching myself every now and again and thinking, did I actually do this? So very happy with the result. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. All right, well, the research strategy it, it wasn't something that, okay, I came up with a research strategy and by gum, we're going to do it. It was something that certainly took some evolution. Uh, most of it was there, uh, and I really started writing about this topic, even vaguely, um, it, starting in my first semester in the fall of uh, 2007 uh, for Dr. Uh, Dr. Bill Fisher uh, for Library 204. Um, and it was just something as simple as, I'm just curious to see the uh, uh, impact of Hurricane Katrina on Gulf Coast libraries wasn't particular for the term paper uh, for that class, and it wasn't particularly focused, and I'm the first to admit that, um, as Debbie, Susie, and Pat will certainly admit as well uh, as time went on, but we certainly got it down to that point, but that's a little later. Um, so my initial research strategy, it began in fall 2008 as a result of taking Library 285 with uh, Debbie Hanson, Dr. Debbie Hanson, sorry Debbie, uh, and that was to incorporate several, uh, several items. I was to look at the uh, existing literature on Hurricane Katrina's impact on libraries, as well as library disasters throughout history. Uh, another component I wanted to include was the utilization of geographic information systems, or GIS, uh, so that I could produce maps uh, to visually demonstrate, or actually visually illustrate, I should say, uh, the impact of Hurricane Katrina on southeastern Louisiana and southern Mississippi libraries. And third, uh, this, is, this is the thing that did have to end up changing, was I initially wanted to obtain first-hand oral histories uh, from library professionals in the Gulf Coast region uh, as a result of a research trip that was going to be planned for the fall of 2009. Sounds simple, right? Well, not so much. We can go to the next slide. 
So as time did go on over the course of the next several months, um, I realized that the part of the strategy dealing with me taking a physical trip down to uh, New Orleans and a, the plan was to go to visit uh, Hattiesburg and along the Gulf Coast there uh, in, in Mississippi, that was just going to become increasingly impractical. And it was uh, to be amended to uh, the next step was to be performing interviews of library professionals uh, remotely via phone and online surveys. Uh, and that sounded easy enough. Um, but however, due to time uh, constraints, this had to be further defined uh, to eliminate the phone interviews and getting the local perspectives via the survey questions. Um, and I thought that would be a pretty logical way to go. And after some, actually a lot of consultation with uh, Debbie, Susie, and Pat, um, and, and rightly so, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, let's go back to that previous slide. I was still in the middle of it. Please, thank you. Uh, the, I had to go through the uh, what's called the SJSU Human Subjects Institutional Review Board, IRB. Uh, it, was, it had to be a sanctioned questionnaire from the university uh, so that I can be approved to send this uh, questionnaire to several library professionals uh, who've been visible in the literature in order to get their feedback for inclusion uh, in, into my thesis. OK, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. OK, so finally, um, by September 2009, the major sections of my thesis were finalized into the following. And again, the first two didn't change. I, I was still looking at the existing literature on Hurricane Katrina's impact on the Gulf Coast libraries, as well as library disasters throughout history. And the second piece, again, uh, utilizing GIS to create maps to show some destruction, uh, not necessarily destruction, but just to show some kind of visualization of, of the disaster's uh, impact on the libraries in the region. And then, again, the uh, IRB uh, questionnaire that was going to be sent to the library professionals uh, electronically. OK, if we can go. OK, so just a little word on the IRB. Uh, this was, I wouldn't go so far as to call it a thorn in my side, but there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of back and forth with uh, my thesis committee and myself and uh, the uh, Office of Graduate Studies and Research. I had to first obtain approval to get this uh, questionnaire out to the professionals. And we had to re just really, really nail down all the, why are we doing this? What are, what's going to be sent to them? What can the respondents expect? that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, we did have to wait four to six weeks for uh, uh, IRB approval. And I, from what I remember, it took closer to four weeks, which was just wonderful, because that certainly expedited everything. And then once I got that approval, I was free to send it out to the, um, to the uh, anonymous uh, Gulf Coast Library professionals. And then here on this slide, I just wanted to show you what the, the questions of the questionnaire. There were, quote, quote, only eight. But these questions, as you can see, they were pretty, um, they're, they're certainly getting a lot of information here that, for my purposes, for my research, was certainly something that I could uh, uh, use. So um, anyway, so uh, as you can see, I was talking about what kind of damage is basically kind of broken down into several parts, uh, just seeing what the, uh, it was what the damage was that the libraries experienced. Um, also, disaster plan preparedness. What was their status at the time of Hurricane Katrina? Uh, was it adequate? Uh, were there gaps in coverage? That kind of thing. And finally, uh, what were the lessons learned for future disasters? And I'll just give you a moment just to look at that. So. Um, OK, so with something like this, the um, sorry, there's some folks out in the hallway. We just had to get that door closed. So sorry about that. Uh, so there were a few bumps in the road here on the way to getting my thesis to, to fruition here. And there, there were several there were several options, not several options, but several issues. Uh, one of them was, as I kind of mentioned earlier, I really had a general research interest in, OK, Hurricane Katrina's impact on Gulf Coast libraries. OK, well, what about it? And I really did have to refine this with, um, with my thesis committee uh, just to make sure it was, a, it was a workable topic. And we eventually got there. Um, and um, I'm, I think I'm very happy with it. Not I think, but I am very happy with the results. And uh, once I was able to nail that down, it was very easy to move forward. Another problem was obviously, as I definitely mentioned earlier, was trying to get this. Uh, I was really married to this uh, idea of going to the Gulf Coast to uh, do this research trip. I really wanted to do it. Uh, but obviously, it just for reasons, uh, it just didn't happen. And um, you know, what are you going to do? It happens. That's life. So as you can see, it evolved from a, a physical research trip to phone interviews to get the oral histories from the library professionals 
to the questionnaire that was sent electronically. Um, and another issue, and I found this out once I discovered, um, once we not discovered anything, but once I got to the part of, of writing this chapter about the questionnaire respondents, um, how to preserve their confidentiality and to protect their identity. The whole point w was that, and when we explained it to them, that they would not be identified by name uh, and by other factors. But what we did decide, just so that, of course, we had to refer to them somehow uh, in the thesis in that particular chapter, that was chapter five. Uh, Basically, we decided to just refer to them by what library they represented, academic, public, or government uh, depository uh, library. And uh, what's geographic location, Louisiana or Mississippi? And that, that seemed to work just fine. And uh, some of the, uh, the GIS data that I wanted to show in the maps, and I'll be showing them to you here momentarily, uh, was I, I was really, really eager, I was really kind of going above and beyond what I was expecting to find. Um, and, but, you know, you got to shoot for the stars, right? So I, I was hoping to find some rainfall intensity and some, and some flood depth data sets so I could just really visualize to the reader what, the, what New Orleans, what southeastern Louisiana and what southern Mississippi was looking at in terms of water depth that would really, really put a fine point on it. But it, it, they weren't available at the time of the map creation, so. Okay, so okay, so uh, this is far and away my most. Uh, this was uh, the the next point here uh, was far and away the biggest uh, issue that I uh, that I dealt with here. Um, Basically, I had to find the library damage statistics in southern Mississippi and southeastern Louisiana, right? Obviously, it's kind of important for my thesis to come to fruition. Uh, guess what? It wasn't in one place. I can tell you that right now. It was, um, I didn't panic. It was nothing like that, but it was just a realization thing. You know, you're in the middle of this, and you have to research it, and you have to find some way to, you know, make it work like Tim Gunn on Project Runway says. Uh, but uh, basically, at the time, most of the information up until that point came from library journals. Uh, you know, like I, like Southeast, I think Southern Mississippi Libraries is one, and, and others, for example, that regularly was running articles on status reports for their libraries. Um, but it was more of a general kind of, it, a general kind of format rather than a detailed uh, accounting of the damage these libraries received. And as a result of that, I had to do some kind of hunt and pecking uh, internet searching and uh, which was, um, it, it actually did yield some results, not too many, uh, as I'll get here momentarily. Um, actually, the, and I can probably just jump ahead here just a bit, that the bulk of the data did come from my contacting Louisiana and Mississippi State uh, Library Associations um, and individual libraries representatives via email correspondence, excuse me. Um, and they were they were sent in a very eager they were a very quick turnaround they were very eager to tell the story help me tell the story, and it was just a fantastic amount of data that was far and away the bulk of the uh, library's data that I received and it was just wonderful. I was honestly expecting to go to you know American Library Association or the Special Libraries Association website, go right to the uh, page that has all the library damage statistics, and I move on my merry way to the to the next part of my thesis. Didn't happen that way as as you can kind of tell. And one of the things that I found out that Debbie and I were kind of going back and forth on, excuse me, uh, was that some of the web pages that I did find st these library statistics on uh, before contacting the Louisiana and Mississippi Library Associations, the Mississippi uh, Library Commission, and the State Library of uh, Louisiana are the ones that I'm referring to here. Um, they were they were there, they were online at the time of my research, which was the fall of 2009. That was really the bulk of my research, the beginning of it anyway, when I was doing this part of my thesis. And then when I came time for doing editing and, and so forth, uh, you know, so I could submit to my thesis committee for review, I kept getting uh, 404 errors and that this page is no longer available. Um, yeah, so that was quite a feeling, but we, 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 got it, we, we worked around it by indicating in the body of the thesis that that information was no longer available. What are you going to do? It's not there, it's not there, but the data did come from, uh, for example, the State Library of Louisiana. So what are the findings? Um, so 
basically the data that I got from these uh, library associations in Louisiana and Mississippi, uh, the professional library journals, uh, and what was available on the internet, uh, it did yield a total of 66 academic, public, and government depository libraries that suffered damage. It was from Hurricane Katrina, obviously, and it was a pretty healthy set, I, I thought. Um, you, I broke it down to there are 16 libraries for which I had data in New Orleans, uh, 29 in uh, Louise, southeastern Louisiana, excluding New Orleans, and 21 in southern Mississippi. Um, and it's pretty obvious that the libraries that did sustain the heaviest damage in Mississippi, uh, they were located in low-lying areas along the Gulf Coast and within close proximity to the Gulf Coast, south of Interstate 10. If you look on a map, Interstate 10 is only several miles away from the Gulf Coast uh, itself, from the water of the Gulf of Mexico. And the reason why that this was so big, um, you have to realize that when Hurricane Katrina did make landfall on August 29th, uh, 2005, it was a Category 3 storm. You see a lot of them. They tend to be, you'll see a lot of these storms uh, come up the, uh, you know, the Atlantic coast and the Gulf coast. The thing is, that was very important, is that this storm was a Category 5, a very strong Category 5, about a day before. So you still had this residual water being pushed out that caused the storm surge that was around 30 feet in places along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And for several miles inland on places, there was, there was substantial flooding. And with all of these uh, communities along, uh, along the Gulf Coast in Mississippi, uh, Gulfport, Biloxi, uh, Ocean Springs, et cetera, they, had, they, were, so, they were just annihilated. So, and so in Louisiana, outside of New Orleans, uh, you know, it, it makes sense because southeastern Louisiana is close to the Mississippi River Delta. You have uh, low-lying areas that are at or even in some places uh, under the uh, uh, Sea le uh, mean sea level, and they they are in uh, flood prone areas. So, and in New Orleans, uh, New Orleans is located in a very flood prone yeah, flood prone city uh, that is below the Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain uh, base levels, and ones that are not basically it's located in a bowl, and the ones that are not located on higher ground within the city suffer the most damage. Um, and it's, it's it's pretty obvious that those libraries that. Um, that did store their collections in the basement or on the first floors of their buildings, as in Mississippi. They, they were the ones that uh, sustained the most damage, especially once the levees failed. OK, so the next several slides here, uh, these are the maps. I compiled the following maps for inclusion in my thesis uh, that just showed you a little more information about what I'm talking about. This first slide um, here, this is just as a kind of give you a little bit of information about where I got the data. I got these GIS data sets uh, from the Mississippi uh, Spatial Data uh, Repository. It's called MARIS, excuse me, M-A-R-I-S. And for Louisiana, it was called ATLAS. Uh, I also received uh, these spatial data sets from uh, FEMA and the Louisiana, yeah, Louisiana State University GIS. Um, all fantastic sources for this kind of spatial data. And at the time that I used them, they still had pages of just pages and pages of these data sets related to it. And it was very helpful. Um, and as you can see, and I initially thought when I created this, well, I don't know many hurricanes that move in right angles like that, uh, almost right angles. But apparently, I did double check, and that was the uh, trajectory on August 29th when Hurricane Katrina did make landfall. It moved straight north and then just did a little, just a little jog to the to the northeast there. Um, and you can see the wind speed at, at landfall. It was still pretty substantial, and it was if you look just to the lower right of uh, that that larger gr uh, blue. Uh, body of water. That's Lake Pontchartrain. That yellowish, uh, creamish color border on this lower right side, that's New Orleans. So you see how close that, that storm came uh, to, to just really, really pounding New Orleans. And it already got destroyed basically the way it was. So if we can move to the next slide, that'd be great. Thank you. OK, these next three slides I just wanted to show. Um, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, my. Yeah, there we go. My com my computer went into power save mode, so I was like, "Hey, everything's going black." Uh, 
this is a map that I created uh, to show the damage caused to Louisiana uh, libraries that, are, that does not include New Orleans, uh, Orleans Parish, where New Orleans is. That's the next slide. And I have represented as the libraries these uh, multicolored icons. The green icon represents uh, minor damage, uh, yellow for moderate damage, and the red for severe damage. Um, I can certainly go into detail, uh, a little bit of detail about what compose, why I chose these uh, classifications for this kind of damage classification. Uh, sorry for repeating myself. Uh, but I can, if you'd like, we can, I can certainly kind of tell you that a little uh, later on here. Um, and as you can see, uh, we have, there's it really kind of spaced out in terms of uh, what the uh, uh, what kind of damage certain places received. And that lightish blue color, that is showing you the stored, the, the surge um, extent. Basically, it's the areas that are flooding. So you can see a lot of these places are in flooded areas. So, and it's, but like I said earlier, this part of uh, Louisiana is very close and in some places uh, under uh, sea level that are protected by levees and dikes. A point of interest I wanted to make note here is toward the top of the uh, of my map here, you see those four blue uh, icons. Those are libraries that did not receive extensive damage, but they were closed nonetheless after the storm because of all the financial difficulties uh, as a result of, of just that area just being completely devastated. So and it's unfortunate, but it happens, I guess. So if we can go to the next slide, that'd be great. OK. And this is another this is a slide showing you the damage caused to New Orleans libraries. Uh, uh, by Hurricane Katrina. And um, I will admit, as, as time has gone on, I'm not the biggest fan of my choice for selection of the flood level uh, shading. But in any event, it is what it is. Got to make it work. So you can see there that I'm still using the same classification category of minor, moderate, and severe damage to these libraries. And uh, a lot of these places, most of them, as you can see, they're in these flooded areas as represented by, these, uh, by that light blue uh, color selection I chose to indicate those flood levels. And this is two days after uh, landfall, which was August uh, 29th, uh, 2005. So and if we can go forth one more, if we can go to the next slide. There we go. Um, now this slide um, is arguably my favorite, because I think this really does just give you a really uh, a good sense for the extent of the flooding here. Uh, the same, same idea, minor, moderate, severe uh, damage uh, library locations here. And just look at all of those library locations. They are located well within, in some places, well within the surge extent uh, of, of how far it came inland. If you look a little to the north of um, where Pascagoula is on towards the right there. Um, that's not, I thought that first that was an exaggeration. There is a bay there, and that went in, I don't know how many miles, I, I, the number escapes me, but it was several miles, and it, that flooding is accurate. So, I mean, you had basically the ocean coming up that far. That is astounding. Um, and then you just have some other, a little farther north here in Hattiesburg, which is the location of, um, uh, let's see, uh, University of Southern Mississippi, uh, they received some minor damage. Uh, and the one on the right there, I believe that was caused by a weakened tree that fell plumb through the middle of a uh, library branch. And that was the end of that library. I would have to research that just to, just to double check, but I remember that stood out quite a bit. So if we can go to the next page, that'd be great. OK, so what were the th uh, my thesis findings on disaster plan effectiveness? Um, as I've already went over, um, I pro in order to get to the point of where I can get these findings out and to convey them, I had to process this library literature related to Hurricane Katrina. Um, how the small and large scale disasters throughout history impacted libraries and the input from these uh, Gulf Coast library professionals, and there were four of them. Um, as a result, it was revealed, and this is pretty obvious, that most of uh, Gulf Coast Library's disaster plans, they were very ineffective at mitigating damage to their collections during the storm because of simply of the, the magnitude of the storm, the flooding during and afterwards as a result of, in some places, the uh, uh, the, levee, the levee collapses, and the, in, the ensuing uh, disaster responses. So, and let's see here. OK, so this one here, uh, one of the questionnaire respondents said it perfectly. He just said it perfectly, that no disaster plan can anticipate a disaster, the magnitude of a Hurricane Katrina. I mean, that was absolutely true. I couldn't get any more, more right than that. Um, so their respondents, as a result of those eight 
questions that I posed earlier. Um, their answers to the questionnaire illuminated several factors that impacted their library's uh, effectiveness uh, at preserving their collections. And there were three that I was able to, de to determine there. The, the library location, the scope of the disaster, and what disasters most plans address. So for the first one, what these libraries were located um, in, in a pretty vulnerable area. But these, these places, these libraries that were located further from areas of flooding, uh, however few, really few there may have been, or on higher ground, they did see less damage, may, may be reduced to a broken window here, a little bit of uh, a, a leaking roof there, a little bit of mold damage, uh, and vice versa. The places that were located in southern Mississippi, for example, on the Gulf Coast, they were, they were annihilated. Uh, many, many of the places were annihilated, and some were rebuilt, but further inland, very wisely if you ask me. Um, and regarding the scope of the disaster, these library, typical disaster library plans, uh, library disaster plans I should say, uh, they are intended to mitigate small localized disasters, a small fire, leaking pipe, or even a power outage that might affect climate control of the library's collections. But not those that affect both large areas, like a hurricane or an earthquake, uh, and uh, it, it affects in many of the uh, library's uh, response and support systems. Uh, and finally, you know, what scope, like what disasters most of these plans address, I mean, they're designed to address events happening singly, one at a time. And let's say in a localized disaster, you know, it's out, fire's out, okay, fine, we'll deal with, uh, assessing the damage and, and replacing the, the damaged or destroyed uh, items. Uh, but it, they're not really meant to, to assist with the succession of events that a disaster the size of a Hurricane Katrina would incur. So we can go to the next slide. So I do have some suggestions as a result of going through my thesis and my findings. Um, I came up with, with uh, three, three items. Uh, to anticipate, library administrators should certainly keep personnel as up to date as possible regarding uh, risks for future disasters that that, that particular library location may be um, uh, susceptible to. Here in uh, you know the Bay Area of California, what is it? the big issue are earthquakes. So, um, you know, it's just dependent on, on the part of the country that these places are located. Another suggestion here is to communicate, uh, to have communication among library personnel, emergency management uh, officials, local, state, and federal authorities. It, it, that's always good. You can never go wrong. You know, knowledge is power. Uh, and the implementation of a current communication tree so library personnel can be contacted after a disaster is advisable. Uh, one of the, res on a, a quick aside here, one of the respondents on uh, my library respondents indicated they had it. They had a communication tree. Not a problem. Problem was, with Hurricane Katrina that came through and it knocked over all of the cell towers, you couldn't, and if you're trying to use a cell phone, good luck, it wasn't going to work. So um, for updating, uh, people, they, library administrators should periodically review and update library's disaster plans. It's, that's just common sense, just as with anything. Uh, make sure it's a well-oiled machine, make sure that it's uh, effective. And finally, to premeditate, uh, this is more for future considerations of where libraries should be planned to, to be and, and to live, basically. Uh, but a lot of thought should certainly be given to where these future library locations are going to be in areas of vulnerability, such as the most susceptible areas of the Gulf Coast. Um, and that just goes without saying. Let's go to the, okay. Final thoughts, everyone. Um, okay, is, is this, uh, my efforts to compose this thesis, to go through all, everything that went through, the preparation, effort, the rewrites, research, and yes, frustration, absolutely, again. Excuse me, this was something that I really enjoyed doing. This was something that I wanted to do. And I don't think, not I don't think, but nothing was going to deter me from getting this done. I really wanted to do it. Um, and for you uh, SLIS students who might be listening uh, or may be listening in the future uh, to this presentation, and if you're on the fence about doing the thesis option, should I do the e-portfolio, from my perspective, I can't recommend it enough. If any of what I've said throughout my presentation here has kind of struck a chord with you, I suspect that you probably enjoy doing the thesis. I found it very rewarding, um, and there's, I still feel an enormous sense of accomplishment. Again, I still pinch myself every now and again. Um, and it's a great... Uh, uh, it was a great research experience. It absolutely was. Um, you know, I was very uh, fortunate in that a lot of what came out in the end with my thesis, it was the, the real nebulous um, 
the core of it was there since the beginning. I, again, like I said, I've always wanted to do this, and um, it really seemed to work out uh, just fine. Um, and as I was going along, yeah, there's going to be changes, and it's not the kind of thing that you go, oh no, there's going to be changes. What am I going to do? And you know, you suck your thumb and you curl up into a ball on the floor. It's something that you just roll with the punches, and it's. I felt that it was just a natural progression of how the thesis was to evolve and to get to its final stage, there are going to be changes needed to be made. But since you're already in that mindset, it's not that difficult. It really isn't. Okay, and I think I have uh, one more slide here. If you do have any questions, this is just kind of going forward here. I wanted to give you my email address if anybody had any questions that you felt like contacting me. Um, anything I could further flesh out after the question and answer uh, period here momentarily. Uh, that's my email address, glengarry72 at yahoo.com, and, um, and this is for anybody who might be interested uh, in accessing this uh, uh, recording at a future date. Uh, you would simply come to this uh, website, uh, HTTPS, remember that S, uh, colon double backslash nexus.sjsu.edu, and then you'll just click on the recordings tab and select today's date and time, and that's uh, October 4th, uh, 12 o'clock. And I believe that's, that's it. I think that's what I got. I think my next slide is just indicating questions and comments. So there we go. So let's see here. All right, if anybody has any questions, I'm, 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 I'm more than happy to. So OK, Angel, I'm seeing your, um, I'm seeing your uh, typed in thing here. Uh, could you describe disaster recovery e uh, efforts of document recovery? Um, some of them seemed, from what I read, they were using a lot of, uh, excuse me, kind of warm in here. They were using a lot of disaster uh, document uh, control specialists. They would use, they would utilize uh, freeze drying methods. Uh, they did, from what I gleaned, they did, they were able to recover a lot of those materials. I mean, obviously there were some materials that were. Uh, that were not able to be saved, but from what I read, they appeared to be pretty successful at even to, to save a lot of these documents, these music recordings, for example, uh, that may have been even underwater for, for days and weeks. They were pretty successful at getting them uh, you know, dried up and, and, and ready for use again. But that's about as much information as I probably have about that. Um, Okay, Marissa. Okay, yeah. Apparently, I guess this is going to be the way to go. Um, let's see. Oh, well, that's a good question. If any libraries completely lost their books, there were. They were primarily located in Mississippi, and for obvious reasons, as my one map showed, that how they were well. A lot of these libraries were just well within uh, the storm surge. There were a lot of these Mississippi libraries that did lose uh, just absolutely everything. Building, uh, I mean, water completely covering the buildings. I mean, there were definitely instances of of that uh, for sure. Yes, yes, there were. Stormy, hello. Um, no, no. Uh, yeah, it breaks my heart. <laughs> yeah, I, I really wish that I could have vis visited the Gulf area. Um, I haven't yet. I do. It is on. You know, it is on my radar. I do want to get down there. And when I do go there, I certainly, you know, more than just, uh, you know, eat my weight in Cajun food. I definitely do plan on on making some kind of, you know, post research trip here just to see for myself you know, kind of how things are, and maybe even interview some folks just, you know, just for my own personal edification. Um, yeah, for sure. I, it's definitely on the radar, but up to this point, no, I haven't just yet. Marissa, hello again. Um, anything, you know, that's, isn't that funny? No, I haven't read anything uh, where historical, anything really historical or important that was completely lost. Um, I didn't read anything where there was any one thing or these handful of collections that just, that was so, so culturally significant that lost, that was completely lost. I was very fortunate not to read that. My overall impression, again, was that most of the items that were damaged uh, by the flooding, uh, they were saved, uh, which is great. But any of the things that were completely not uh, saved, they didn't appear to be not in, in significant, but not really historically significant, like copies of, like Louisiana's copies of the, the Declaration of Independence or anything like that. So, um, Loretta, hi Loretta, nice to see you again. Um, let's see here. 
Yeah, Loretta, um, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback. I've got a lot of positive feedback about uh, the restaffing of the libraries and the rebuilding of the libraries. I Even with a lot of these libraries that were completely destroyed, the, what I got was I got a lot of positive feedback indicating that they uh, had, if not rebuilt right on the same spot, or they would rebuild it at a place further inland. They had a lot of community uh, assistance with people just donating books, um, all sorts of drives similar to that to just restock any collections that were lost in the flooding. Uh, it was, and, and the restaffing didn't, there were some issues, of course, with some people, you know, not only is a storm, is a, something like Hurricane Katrina a, a real physical issue, but it also plays a big psychological role in um, how some people, do they want to return into such a vulnerable area where they can lose everything again that they've built up over the course of a lifetime just like that. Um, there were certainly some issues uh, that I did come across where folks left their positions because of that, but my, my impression, again, from what I've read uh, and from what I've researched, most of the folks did come back and they were just, it was like they it just completely mobilize them to really dig their heels and to just get those libraries back up and running. That was a very positive um, side effect of, of Hurricane Katrina. Okay, hi Martina. Um, okay, let's see. Did the libraries lose vital records? Um, you, isn't that interesting? I would have to assume that they did. I did not I can almost say for certainty I did not come across any of the literature that specifically mentioned uh, um, losing the vital records. I I didn't really come across anything specifically mention that. Um, oh, what did they do? Oh, Martine, I can tell you that in order for them to recover from such losses, I should almost just send you an email uh, with some of the information because um, there, there were so, certainly some, for example, some of the uh, folks who did uh, respond to me for the questionnaire, uh, parts of my questionnaire did respond just did indicate, you know, what have you done to uh, recoup from this? Uh, how are you going to prepare for further uh, uh, disasters? And some of them, boy, they really went into some great detail about how they did recover from, from these losses. Um, let's see here. Um, some of the libraries did, uh, from what I understand. Uh, some of them just were how, what's a good word for it, were just uh, kind of, uh, they were accepting of their situation of where they are in such a vulnerable area. Um, there was a particular respondent that honestly did not instill a lot of uh, faith it was almost like he was, that was, that's the word I'm looking for, he was really resigned to what the, uh, um, basically let the chips fall where they may. Uh, the uh, rationale that was given to me being that because of they're in such a vulnerable area, uh, that it was almost expected to happen. But the other respondents, for example, um, they did indicate that they have changed their plans radically. For example, taking their collections out of the basement, which, or in the first floor, especially if you're very close to levees and the Gulf Coast. That makes perfect sense. Uh, that's certainly what they did. And let's see, let me get to your last question here. Uh, did you come across the impact of larger state and private archives? Um, let me see here. There were certainly some archives that were lost, uh, of course, I mean, along with regu you know, regular library collections. Uh, I think you'll see a lot of those uh, that were not. Uh, I didn't read a lot. I didn't read anything that indicated how crippled the archives community is uh, in in the Gulf Coast area, based on how much they lost. Is it at a standstill for those states? Um, I, that's about as that is about as far as my as my research took me. Um, I didn't recall reading or coming across much indicating how how impacted the archives, uh, the, the status of archives and uh, special collections were in those, you know, southern Mississippi and southeastern uh, Louisiana. Um, okay, let's see, two microphones available. Uh, did you come, let's see, hi Angel, oh, okay, there you go. Um, did I come across any films or videos of destruction in libraries? No. Unfortunately, I didn't. Um, I, I've certainly come across a lot of literature. Um, I did purchase myself uh, a few DVDs of just 
information about the hur about the Hurricane Katrina's damage. Uh, National Geographic had one called I think it was called Inside Hurricane Katrina, just just jaw dropping. And of course, Spike Lee's when the levees broke. You want to cry? That's that's something to watch. It, but it's something that I think a lot of people need to see. Uh, that was just something to watch. But unfortunately, no, I, I really was looking for uh, videos that dealt with how libraries responded uh, to Hurricane Katrina and the flooding. Unfortunately, I couldn't find it. Um, okay, Martina. Oh, you're welcome, Martina. So. Um, I actually wanted to know if his thesis was available for reading or purchase or something, because I was in Houston, Texas at the time, and I was around for Allison, Ike, Katrina, Rita, and I have family in Louisiana as well, and I wouldn't mind reading what he wrote, and I was just wondering how I might be able to read what he wrote. Okay, hi Stormy. Yes, it is available, um, and I was actually quite surprised at how fast my, my uh, thesis did go to uh, publication, and it is currently available, and the good news is uh, that you could certainly, it, there's a downloadable copy that is available through the MLK library, uh, and it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty straightforward uh, when you go, I, can't remember specifically what the uh, the navigation is, um, but you can certainly look for the just theses that have been published uh, since, say, 2010. Mine will show up there, and then you could just follow the links there to get to where you could just click the PDF copy of it, and there you are, and it'll all be there for you. Well, thank you very much for attending, everybody. I really appreciate it. Uh, again, uh, I, if you're on the fence as a SLIS student, um, wanting to do this, as wanting to do a thesis as your culminating experience with the SLIS program, can't recommend it enough. Absolutely can't recommend it enough. It was just wonderful. And I know that the resources uh, SLIS has here uh, in terms of their faculty, you will not be disappointed. I can guarantee you that. Thank you very much and have a great day, everyone. Jeff, uh, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for sharing your experience uh, of the doing the um, thesis, but also sharing uh, some of the facts from your uh, topic. You just did an excellent job, and we sure appreciate your sharing that today. So thank you very much. Be sure to look at the uh, SLIS webpage. We um, have career colloquia coming up, and Mara colloquia, and more general and. Uh, we have most of these scheduled and publicized through the fall, so I hope you can, can join us.